Palatan area. So uh, thanks for coming um, out to our talk. And uh, thanks to RVA Sec and all the organizers, volunteers. Uh, I think it's been a great conference so far. So glad, glad they had us. Um, so our topic uh, for the day or for the next hour is, so you've purchased a SAS tool. Um, and the implied question here is really, uh, what now? Uh, I think you know, a lot of people out there are buying SaaS tools and they're just trying to figure out, you know, maybe check a box or get moving and they just keep on lo looking at these HP fortifies and these check marks and these app scan source and they bought this SaaS tool. you're going tool. a little far. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, here, Jake, why don't you uh, talk about SaaS a little bit? So yeah, why don't we, we start with a quick introduction to, to what we mean by SaaS. Um, Gartner, I mean the industry, <laughs> have kind of come up with a couple naming conventions and just to make sure everyone's on the same page when we talk about SAST and DAST and SAS, um, when we talk about SAS, we're talking about you know static application security testing. So it's also, you'll hear it as source code review, you'll hear it as static analysis. Um, for all of these things, we're talking about looking at an application uh, from a static perspective, so it's not running. You're just looking at usually the code. Uh, everyone, every company out there, for the most part, is doing some sort of dynamic analysis, um, the DAS side of the house. And for that, that's your pen test. That's what you know. security has gotten really good at for very long. We've been doing this for a very long time. But SAS and DAS are gonna find two kind of, two different things they can both be used to find your OWASP top 10 type vulnerabilities. So if you look at the kind of center of the Venn diagram, which is huge, cool. <laughs> if you look at the center of, of it, the OWASP top 10 type vulnerabilities like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, both static and dynamic analysis will find. But there are a number of things that static analysis will we'll find a lot easier than you'll find in a dynamic assessment. So if you talk about like uh, crypto issues, if you're looking at cryptography, inside of static analysis, you can easily see when someone's rolling their own crypto. When you're looking at it from a dynamic perspective, you see a bunch of base 64 encoded variables and you're like, I don't know if they're doing it right or not. <laughs> Static, you can tell. Uh, and so some other issues uh, that you can find are hard-coded secrets, um, password in the config files, we still see all over the place. We have HSM guys. <laughs> so there, there are uh, different things you can find in static. So it's important to kind of look at both of those when you're actually looking for vulnerabilities in your environment. If we have anyone from IBM here who thinks that this looks familiar, we, we do call credit out at the very bottom. Very, very bottom. <laughs> in the fine print. In the fine print. Yeah, we, we pulled this graph, but we had to recreate it. Uh, but it, it does properly capture kind of the difference between the two methodologies. But the next question kind of becomes, um, who's doing it? I mean, you know, there, there is these methodologies, but the who out there in the industry is actually doing static analysis or static application security testing? You'll hear us use these terms interchangeably throughout, because I never use the same one. Um, but in order to really get to who's doing it, uh, I want to introduce uh, uh, another topic that will kind of get to some data. So at Sigital, we have a thing called the BSIM. Um, it's the Building Security and Maturity Model. And it's a model we established a couple years ago, back in around 2008, when the industry was starting to really tell people how they should do things. Um, they were, it was kind of a very prescriptive world. You know, there was different things, and they're saying, you should do this to solve your security problems. You should do that, right? We took a step back and we were like, well, let's actually look at companies and see what they're actually doing and come up with data around it and, and kind of build a model off of what's actually happening in the industry. We had a lot of good relationships with some banks, some tech firms, and we kind of studied their organizations. Um, through that study and the study over the past uh, six or seven years, um, we're up to BSIM 6 now, uh, we've been able to kind of see the industry shift and, and watch for some trends in this data. Uh, it's all available for free, uh, you know, the, the, the model that is, on bsim.com. And this spider chart is meant to kind of show the different domains. Um, the, the model is broken into uh, 12 practice areas and four domains. Uh, the four domains are governance, intelligence, secure SDLC, and deployment of software, right? Um, there's actually uh, 78 firms uh, in the bsim 6. 
and they perf we performed over 200 some measurements of their firms, trying to see what they're all doing. You know, sometimes they'll do it of individual BUs, um, you know, they'll do it for different development groups, things like that, to try to really get a cut across their organization. Um, but these are the different practice areas. Uh, probably in the back, I can imagine you can't see them all. Um, but I'll just name a couple. It is out there on BSIM.com. This is not the focus of the talk, but I want to introduce it. Um, strategy and metrics, compliance and policy, kind of going around uh, down to the 3 o'clock. We have like attack models, um, standards and requirements. But the real focus of this talk is, uh, let's see, what's that, 7 o'clock position, which is code review, and it's in the uh, same as SAST. So we have, um, I, I break this out into the actual activities that are, uh, are part of the BSIM. Um, there's, these are, uh, let's see, maybe about 15 activities that are listed here for performing code review and what we see people are doing in the industry. Um, so to go, like, go through a couple of these, like at the very top, it's like a level one activity. That's not meant to say it's easy. Uh, that just means more people are doing it. Um, it's kind of a lighter touch activity. It's not uh, super crazy difficult like maybe some of the lower ones. But it's not uh, a linear like the way you might see a CMMI type model for maturity. It's actually kind of more, we see a lot of people doing the level one activities. Level three seems to be harder because not as many people do them or not as many groups are actually performing them. So don't take the levels to mean like it's really hard to do those level three activities. Um, but at the top is like something like uh, use a top end bugs list. That simply means taking um, a, you know, all the vulnerabilities that are being seen across the organization and picking like five of them that you're gonna use for your organization. Rather than using like OS top 10, you're gonna say, well these five are what we actually see in our organization and these are the ones we care about and we wanna drive change you know, throughout our organization. Uh, you know, 1.5 is mandatory code review. So take uh, a tool and require that people scan their code and review the code for security vulnerabilities. Uh, getting to like a level two activity, we have uh, uh, enforced coding standards. That might mean taking like some, you know, an external like an OWASP coding standards or maybe building your own uh, internal coding standards and enforcing those through the tool. Um, getting into, let's see, 2.6 is like customizing the rules. So, you know, a lot of people out there are buying the tool, but then actually customizing that tool and, you know, trying to drive change via tool, via the customization of the rules and what you're looking for. In particular, if you can tie it to like, you know, your top five bug list, that could be a really interesting story. Uh, but, you know, looking at this, I highlighted the most common activity and it is use an automated tool. So what does that mean? That means everybody, well, at least 55 of 78 are buying static analysis tools. Um, you know, that's what it is. That's what we saw as we, and that's kind of been consistent also across the different versions of the BSIM over the years. Everybody buys a tool. Uh, everybody maybe puts it on there on the shelf and it becomes shelfware. I don't know. Uh, it, they plop it in the environment and, hey, we checked the box. We have static analysis capability. Are we actually using it? Uh, the BSIM doesn't actually say, are you doing it well? It just says whether you did an activity or not. So all this means is they have an automated tool and they've scanned some code. Doesn't mean anything about they got good coverage across the organization or they're driving change with the tool. So why is that? Why, do, why does the industry just buy tools? Uh, I might ask you guys that question after the fact if you want to come talk to me, but I have a few theories. Um, I think it's easy to buy a tool. Uh, most people, you know, you can vet the technology, you can get out there and kind of understand the different, the ins and outs of the tools, you know, you, you know your frameworks, you know your code base, you know your IDs perhaps. So it's relatively easy to vet the tool and maybe get through the budgeting process, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's not so easy to get through the budgeting process, but for, you know, people get the tools in the end and that happens. But then they got to actually roll out the tool in, within the organization. And people tend to hit a wall there. Uh, you know, either people, they have to drive change, they have to get people to actually use it. And that's really where there's a wall. Um, we tend to hear a couple of different complaints. The tool is noisy uh, is a very common one. You know, there's a ton of false positives. Um, or this tool slows down my developer workflow. Those are really common uh, walls that people run into. When they, after they've bought a tool, so they got through the easy step, 
they're ready to build out a program, and then no one does it because uh, it's so slow, it's hurt my developers, we gotta get to market, you know, whatever the reason is. You're starting to bum me out, man. I know, it's a bummer. There are good things about static analysis, though. There are absolutely some benefits, because like I said, 55 firms that we measure out of the 78 are doing it. So what are some benefits? Well, if you see at the bottom, we have, uh, we have the SSDLC, so your secure software development lifecycle. And historically, when, when firms start testing, they usually do the test from a uh, assurance perspective. So running dynamic penetration tests at the far end. So just before you're getting feedback from the field is when you're starting to test your software. By starting to do static analysis, you can actually move it to the left and start to start to find them easier. We did save you from seeing the slide that every bug presentation I'm pretty sure has shown of over time, the longer it takes you to find a bug, the more expensive it is. Everyone see, I'm getting some nods. Everyone's seen this slide time and time we again. We want to put that in here. So you're welcome. <laughs> we'll just talk about it. <laughs> But so when you when you start to do static analysis, you're you're actually moving further to the left, and it's in an assurance model. You can still do static analysis at that rightmost phase, but you can move it to the left. And as code is being developed, perform testing. And the big benefit to this, the one of the single most important benefits, is that you're helping to change developer behavior. You're no longer bolting on security once you've finished your project. Once you've gotten a feature complete, you're not then going, oh wait, now how do we secure it? You're moving to the left and actually changing developer behavior so that you're building secure code from the start and not waiting until the end to make it secure. And you can change developer behavior in a number of ways. And one of the easiest ways is providing code-specific feedback. So instead of saying, you have SQL injection, it's on this page, I don't know exactly where in your code it happens, you can say, on this line in this file, you are, you are introducing an untrusted input and flushing it right back to the user. You need to do sanitization. You can give them, on the spot, very accurate uh, remediation advice. And one of the really cool things that you can do as well in your organization is use static analysis to start enforcing coding standards. Um, that's not specific to security either. If you have standards of you must use X, Y, or Z framework, you can put that in a static analysis tool and actually check and tell them about it. But there are some, some truths that we hold to be self-evident. <laughs> And, and the first is that out of the box, static analysis tools are noisy. There are a lot of false positives and there are a lot of false negatives. I think I lost myself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> so out of the box are a lot. That's actually by design though. They want to report as much as possible to you. As a security person, you have the knowledge to filter down and actually trim out. But because of this, there's, if there's one thing you can take away from this talk, and, and I would be so happy if you did, stop asking what your false positive ratio is. It's a bad question. <laughs> they're all gonna have a lot of false positives unless they're not telling you everything you need, in which case you're looking at more false negatives now. Yeah, we'll talk a bit about tuning that in a minute, but that's the way they're designed. The tools are meant to find a lot of different things for coverage purposes. So we'll talk a little bit in a, in a few slides about like how you can take that noisy engine that creates tons and tons, maybe thousands of findings, and pare that down to something that you can take action on. Yeah, and some other things that, regardless of what tool you're deploying, where, when we're talking about static analysis tool, there are a couple other things that always, always are true. And one of them is that the deployment model matters. And we'll talk a lot about deployment models here, but uh, really we're talking about how is the tool deployed inside of your organization? And it's not a simple case of you just install it on a server, you walk away and you're done. There are models for how your people and your process have to align around the technology. At the end of the day, it's people, process, technology. Over and over, people, process, and technology. But when, when we're looking at these, it's, 
it's important to select the right technology, but then it's even more important to build the right capabilities around that. And to that point, one thing that's, that's very important is the cost of a static analysis tool isn't just in licensing, because Every, every static analysis tool is going to take an investment in terms of training your people in the process and in the technology, and also the time cost and actually rolling out and deploying static analysis tools because it's, it's not, a, again, it's not a flip the switch and you now have static analysis. And we'll talk more about that onboarding. But when we actually look at what are what are the different types of, of static analysis? Uh, again, there's, there's kind of a shift moving from the right to the left of the SSDLC. And normally when, you, when, when companies start doing static analysis, they start at the very right with assurance testing. They wait for the code to be complete, and then they have a security expert go in, run a sc scan of the code, do some manual probing, and do a, essentially an assurance test. So you're, you're assuring that nothing is inside of your code, but this is after the code's already been developed. You can actually start to shift left on, that, on the SSDLC and start to detect things earlier. And with the, with the detection mode, we're talking about that, that second tier where you have, you have static analysis on the build server. So a lot of times, uh, now that developers are starting to lean more heavily to continuous integration, continuous deployment, we're seeing this is a much more common model of installing on the build server a static analysis tool so that when you run your nightly or your weekly builds, you can actually scan your code at that point and get back to the developers vulnerabilities that you've identified. So this is a, a mostly automated process that just kicks off and tells your developers you know, what's going on as they're just doing their business as usual. And then to move the furthest left, the, the newest trend that we're starting to see in a number of organizations is more of a prevention model. And that's running static analysis inside of your IDE, inside of a developer's IDE, running quick checks just things that you can flag to developers instantly so that they know they're introducing a security vulnerability before that even goes into your code repository. So some easy examples of this would be, uh, again, the, the basic easy ones are always SQL injection, right? You can, all, you can check inside of the IDE if a developer has, has used a dynamic query. And you can say, hey, you shouldn't do that. You should use parameterized queries. Here's how you do it. And then they save, they check in their code without that vulnerability, and you've saved a tremendous amount of headaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and I mean, this is heavily about the technology, but we still haven't talked about really the people in process. So let's talk a little bit about deployment models. Uh, we have, the, we're gonna go in each one of these, so if you can't quite see this, although it actually is larger than I expected. Um, we're gonna talk about each one of the different models, but the whole, model at the bottom is moving from a decentralized model towards a more centralized model of you know, who's actually doing the, uh, the code review and the, and the running of the tools. Um, the interesting thing that I wanted to point out here was actually the trend we tend to see across the country. Uh, so on the East Coast, we tend to see people uh, having a central service bureau. We're gonna talk about what that means, but that, keep that in mind as we go through the deployment models. They, it's just kind of something we've observed. The East Coast tends to have central uh, service bureaus, the Midwest tends to have a security as a service where they like to you know, maybe have a third party do it or some sort of on-demand service. And then on the West Coast, it, they, you see more of the automation, the, the build integration and continuous integration aspect of it. Yeah, so that's just, just a trend we've observed because yeah. we work with really organizations across the country. So an interesting trend. But if we if we start looking at the different ways that static analysis tools are deployed, um, we can start at the, at the leftmost and the more of the self-service model. And this is uh, the build integration piece. And in this piece you have sitting on the build server that development's working on, um, the static analysis tool will run there and give, give the feedback directly to the developers. This is really the fastest model because 
the only person involved with the scan and the triage is the developer. And then they can reach out to security as they have questions, but this is, this is getting the results to them as quickly as possible. And you can integrate it inside of their workflow so that it becomes part of their BAU. The cons, because it is being ran by a developer and not uh, necessarily a security SME, there's a heavy upfront cost to setting up the tool and to customizing it in such a way that it actually makes the developer's life more easy and do it doesn't overly complicate and make them hunt through Google Foo for hours about what a specific vulnerability is. So the, that upfront cost is a lot higher for build integration, but it's less noisy and, and a little easier on the developers when you set it up correctly. Uh, one of the risks with it is typically this is a bit of a self-reporting model because security doesn't necessarily go through and prune the results. They're not necessarily keeping track of what's going on and they're just waiting for developers to tell them what they've identified from their static analysis. Yeah, and on the developers getting the results directly, that can be a problem. However, even in this model, we'll talk about uh, customizing rules such that this might be a little bit easier. Because in this one, if they get those results directly from the tool, the number one thing we hear is, oh, so many findings. Like, what do I do with this you know, huge report of 30,000 vulnerabilities, uh, maybe? More like code coverage issues or something. But we'll talk a little bit about pruning that down. But go ahead. <laughs> vulnerabilities <laughs> with a question mark. Yeah, <laughs> vulnerabilities, you know, issues, something. <laughs> So if we, move, if we move a little further to the right to a more centralized model, um, another thing that we see very often is a scanning factory where uh, in, a, in a scanning factory, the developer will upload their code, have it run, it'll come back to them, they'll prune out what they can and send it to the security team to um, review the final results. And that way you've, you've fixed some of the self-reporting, although there is a, a component of that. The security experts are getting involved more. And this, this does help scale out, because I don't know an organization that has as many security people as they have developers. I don't know an organization that has a security person for every 20 developers. You know, the BSIM data is something like two, per, two or three per 100 developers, yep. security people, so. so so this way you're not fully centralized and you're not, you're not taking all of your security resources for just static analysis. So this does help scale out. Um, but again, some of the cons means you have to have security expertise um, in-house to, to be able to really help the developers. And there is a licensing cost issue with this as well. It tends to be kind of expensive and require a number of licenses. Again, that depends on the tool. It's just something that we've, we've seen in a number of places. But if we're gonna shift further right on that scale and kind of the last of the, the main models that we see for deployment, uh, that's the, the service bureau. So this is the least self-service you can get. Um, this has your, your developers will supply their source code to the security SME who will go through and go ahead and run static analysis will prune and do all of the triage required and give back actionable results to the developer. Um, the biggest pro here is that your developers are getting what they need to fix. They're not getting a list of bugs that they are gonna research if they should be worrying about. <laughs> but you can get, um, you have your, essentially your security people are doing a lot of the lifting for your developers so that the developers can focus on what they need to be doing. It turns to be a fairly low licensing cost model because you're just buying licenses for your security folks as opposed to every build server you have out there. Or every developer. Or every developer, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the biggest con here is that it, it does tend to be the slowest model and require uh, a lot of upkeep to make sure that the security person's getting everything they need. And we'll talk about some of the, some of the pains that, that security people will have as they start to onboard applications and scan applications. Well, yeah, so I mean, so far we've kind of talked about people in the process now with deployment models, but that doesn't really help you get started. So we thought it'd be good to kind of hit on some themes that we think are important when people really purchase the tool and they're ready to roll out the program. Um, you know, 
I think the, for the most part across the industry, like I said earlier, you qualifying and figuring out what tool you need is something we do pretty well. So looking at things like the uh, language support or exactly how you think it'll roll out best in your organization, people tend to know that pretty well, ask the right questions. But when it comes to um, the, the next challenge is uh, coming to onboarding the applications. So what the main thing here is don't bite off more than you can chew. Like try to, try to get a couple of applications ready to go um, and, and bring in uh, you know, one or two primary applications and do some scanning and triaging with the security group because that's also going to teach your security group the things that are coming up most often by the static analysis tools. So you can start to say, well, we're going to bring in a couple applications, really get their buy-in to the program, and then eventually they'll help probably even evangelize it across the organization to get other groups in there. They'll be like, hey, you know, security actually really helped us out on this one versus being a blocker, which is always the other message. Um, and we're going to talk more about customizing rule packs, but the important thing here is then maturing the program. That does not mean it has to be like immediately right off the bat, but over the next, you know, once you purchase the tool over the next couple of years, mature the program at, by customizing rule packs and really starting to get that automation in there to help, you know, drive it quicker um, and, and cut down on the noise that, that everyone always wants to talk about. So you want to talk about onboarding a little bit more? Yeah, before we go too far into the maturing, uh, the onboarding is a, a huge piece of having a successful deployment of, of a static analysis tool. So the, the overall flow for how onboarding works, first absolutely starts with setting the expectations correctly. Um, with every security deployment, you have to set expectations and make sure that the, everyone in the process knows what's going on. Um, if you select, no matter what deployment model you select, it, it will require some training for your, either your developers, your security people, or both. And it's important to set expectations up front of what people's roles are and to start the training process early as opposed to, you know, when you've started to, to mandate static analysis. Um, a big suggestion to save a lot of hassle is to start with an application that either you know the best or uh, one of the most responsive development teams. Um, if there's a development team that you know you can bribe with pizza and beer, go for them. <laughs> because it's very important to, to make sure that when you're onboarding these applications, you have a team that will go above and beyond to help make it successful. Um, so some of the problems that we'll see when we start when you start scanning is you'll get some source code, some not all. Uh, rarely do you get the the whole project your your first time of asking. So it's important to have the development team realize that they're going to need to go through and make sure that you have the complete project that you're scanning. And then once you go to build it, um, make sure that it actually builds. There are a number of tools out there that, that say they work without requiring a full build because after all, they're just looking at code. They can make assumptions and guesses, but we find that when you do that, the results aren't nearly as good and it becomes even noisy for a security person to go through and see what they figure is trusted or untrusted frameworks. And if you just work up front with your development team, to fully build the fully build the application, you'll get much better static analysis results. So we have then uh, triaging the results, and you know there, there's a there's an activity there in when you're bringing an application in and ready to start doing the security testing, the static security testing on it, um, where you're just going through the results that you found on that specific application. But we we. To, in order to mature the program then, the next step is starting to pull some of the themes from what you found and figuring out how you're going to um, customize the rules. Because that's really the most, uh, I, you know, I think it's probably the most important part of it because you're going to head off the issues of we find too many things with static analysis, it's too, uh, it's too noisy. If you start customizing the rule pack and you learn from the triaging step, which is when that security person is helping bring that application in, and they get that first scan done, they triage, they start to find some of the themes or the main vulnerabilities, you can now start to drive that uh, into custom rule packs. 
So uh, Jake wouldn't let me put it's easy on here. Um, I think this is the most important part at the very least. I don't know if it's easy. Um, all the tools have a way for you to customize rule packs. Um, they, they may have their own specific formats for doing it. Things, uh, some of them are like uh, XML markup language type thing. Uh, some of them are actually their own like query language for reviewing the code. However it does it, uh, figure out how it does it and then customize the rules. It's like, the, I, I, it just, I think it's the most important part because you can really accomplish um, all the three tiers that, uh, that Jake presented on prevention, detection, and assurance with different types of rule packs. So the way I would do this, um, I take that rule pack that's default uh, or that comes with the product and I'm gonna keep that as my assurance rule pack. I want the noisiest thing you can possibly find. I, wanna, I want coverage. And as a security guy, I'm like, give me the false positives, I'll review them, I'll let you know where the real issues are. So I want that noisy rule pack, that's the tier three assurance side. Um, and as a, I guess the SME, I don't know if I'm a SME, but I, you know, I know a little bit about code. Um, I will go through those things and I will find of all this noise, I, I'll probably prune out some and give you the real results. But you keep that rule pack around because you want the coverage throughout all the uh, application. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna triage that out and give the ones that really matter, whether it's through bug tracking or directly to in a report, I'm gonna give the ones that matter to the development team. Then I'm gonna get into tier two. I'm gonna build my own separate rule pack. This, whoever is working in tier two will never know about the other ones if I had to control this. Where I'm gonna, you know, maybe tease down on some of those noisier rules, cut those out, um, and really focus on, you know, I guess the less noisy ones, and uh, a little bit more critical rules, or uh, some of the ones that are a little bit more accurate in what they find, so that that when the build, uh, if I, if I did this in a build integration type model, um, when when it scans it every night the developer is getting a little bit more targeted results. There might still be some noise, but they're gonna get something that they can take action on, most likely. And we can have a conversation about the rest of them, you know, like, but they're gonna get some top findings. The tier one pack, what I would do is make it like five issues, you know, maybe 10, um, that, I, that I would find in tier one, which is gonna be in that prevention. Something either in the IDE or something that's automatic or as soon as they build it type of model. Because um, what that's gonna do, you're gonna get very, like maybe the five uh, rules that your organization's trying to, or the five vulnerabilities that your organization's trying to eradicate and get rid of and not have a problem with anymore, gonna get those as early as I can so that you can head off those issues. And then later, you know, you find some of the maybe more subtle vulnerabilities, right? Uh, the tools have those, and some of them are particularly well, like SQL injection can be found by every tool. So you get that one into the uh, tier one type model and you're gonna head off those issues early. Uh, but something like an input validation rule, which is common in a static analysis tool, that those are particularly noisy, and I may not want my developer to get that on their desktop all the time because they're gonna be like, I don't know what to do with this. It's a false positive. Well, it's not necessarily a false positive. So I'll leave that triage to the, to the central group, the security group, and I'll give them the ones that I really wanna get rid of, and I'll write some custom rules that I, um, that I know I care about as an organization. The nice thing about that is it actually will tag well to the BSIM program or the BSIM model because uh, just by talking about that, and I'll go back to some of the levels, we have code review uh, 1.1 and 3.3 being accomplished. 1.1 is use a top five list uh, or a top end list, whatever you prefer, maybe even a top one. We're gonna eliminate this vulnerability this year. Um, you can put that into that rule pack that's on every developer's uh, you know, light rule pack and then hopefully you can eradicate it which is uh, code review 3.3. So if you take those two, just doing this type of a model with the rule packs, you can knock out two BSIM activities if that's what you're driving towards, I know everyone is. Uh, or you, know, you, can, you actually can start to say we have eliminated top five from the OWASP top 10 because we got it immediately feeding back into the developer's workflow. And that's just via the tier one type of a rule pack. Um, I know like uh, check marks uh, is another static analysis tool. Uh, Secure Assist is a static analysis tool. They, check marks has a programmatic way to do it. It's like a query language that they use to write custom rules. Secure Assist is an XML markup. So once you kind of get in there and, and see like, okay, this is how I write a custom rule, from that part, it's easy, which is why I was gonna leave it's easy in there, because I think 
once you know that it does it a certain way, you can just create rules, create different rule packs. You can have different ones to solve different jobs, and you give them to the people that are doing certain things. Perhaps there's a development group that has a specific framework um, that they're working with, and that has a certain vulnerability tied to it. If you use it in a certain way, uh, that's a custom rule type scenario, and I'm only going to give that to the development teams that I know are working with that framework. I'm not going to give it to everyone because everyone else will be like, why did this rule fire? It's not related to me. So uh, let's see. So what, you know, with, if you pick the people in the process, that one of the deployment models, you start to drive custom rules, we, we can see that we've accomplished some VSIM activities. Um, so going back into this, we started off at just uh, 1.4, which is use automated tool. That's what everybody does. Everybody buys a tool and perhaps can scan, scan some code. Um, but if you take all the different things we just talked about and you drive them, we can probably get something like this. Um, I can show, you know, a full program because we have level three, good coverage in a level two, and a level one. And in fact, we can get a little farther because uh, like a 3.2, which is build a factory, uh, that might be there depending on which deployment model you choose. So I left it unchecked because it kind of depends. But something like eradicate a bug, or customizing the rule pack, well, we've already we've checked those as activities that we'll do as a part of just editing the rules, right? Uh, or, uh, let's see, mandatory code reviews. Well, if it's happening in the IDE or in the build, you've already got uh, the mandatory set part checked, so we could check that box. And the top end bugs list, that's how you're driving that down anyway uh, into the custom rules, so we check that one. So now we have good, solid vSIM focused program. Um, and then the other one that is, oh, we left out centralized reporting out of all of this. Um, you know, there is obviously, everyone's got to track data on what you're actually finding and showing return on investment and all that. We left that kind of out of, out of the scope of this talk, but you know, with all these different ones, the, the results feeding back into some sort of central reporting, you're going to get more targeted results. You're going to see better data in your central reporting system if you use the custom rules the way we kind of laid out there with those different tiers. So is that going from zero to rocket science? Yeah, I think it is zero to rocket science. <laughs> we said it's easy, right? But there's, you know, you got to get in there and kind of learn a little bit about the custom rule development. But once you get to that point, and it's, like I said, it's XML, uh, you know, we, we can handle it. So really, a uh, couple of, I guess, these are our kind of concluding thoughts, really. Um, the big static analysis tools out there, the HP Fortify, the, um, the IBM AppScan source, Checkmarks, Secure Assist, these tools that are out there are very powerful. They're, they're going to find a lot of different vulnerabilities, and we really have to customize and, and build out with them, because they're out of the box. They are that noisy tool with a lot of findings. And we've talked about static analysis uh, exclusively in this talk, but, but really one thing that's important to note, despite what marketing will tell you, there is no silver bullet. There is, there is no, if you buy this tool, you have now solved your security problem. I know static analysis vendors love to say that, but it's just not the truth. A holistic approach is required to make sure you're looking for bugs and flaws throughout your organization and really working to build secure code from the beginning. Yeah, and I think it was interesting because we were over in one of the other talks and they were talking about dynamic pen testing and running tools where they found a ton of false positives. It's kind of the same message for the two different uh, application security testing models or, or methodologies where you're, we're saying, it, you know, just purchasing the tool isn't going to solve the problem necessarily, but building the program uh, and people and process around that technology is what's really going to, you know, get you to the next level. Uh, we, we have to always remember that the cost to remediate is always going to go uh, higher the longer the bug remains undiscovered, right? But that's, uh, so with static analysis, you're going to find those things earlier. And in particular with the custom rule pack in the tier one, I think you're going to see that, uh, that kind of metric show up a lot better because you're going to see things getting solved. You're not going to see a SQL injection in a pen test because you've found a custom rule pack that is going to really drive that out of the organization. If it gets to a dynamic pen test and you found it, something else went wrong, right? You found a SQL injection, but you have a good rule set, something else went wrong. 
Hey, Brenton, what are the three parts to uh, rolling out a static analysis? Qualify, implement, and mature. <laughs> No, so uh, the key thing from, from our perspective is it's all about people and process around the technology. Uh, at the BSIM data showed it's, you know, everybody buys that tool, but you got to really build the people and process around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any, other, any, any questions on, on that? Hoping for questions on building custom rules. <laughs> well, then, thank you guys. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.